Today on Treasure Top, if you died tonight, why would God let you in to his heaven? Hi, it's Pastor John Haggard at Treasure Top. Today we will discuss what a lot of people want to know. If you died tonight, why would God let you in to his heaven? If you're a first-time listener or maybe you've joined us recently, you can also hear my other podcast messages about how to make life work when life does not want to work. Just go to treasuretop.com and look for the podcast tab and subscribe at the same time so that you never miss a message going forward. And for all of these messages, I quote mostly from the NASB translation of the Bible, unless I note otherwise. Before we answer the question, if you died tonight, why would God let you in to his heaven? There's one thing I want you to first know, and this is important as it relates to receiving the word of God. And it's found in Genesis 2-7, the first book of the Bible. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. I believe that God also formed man to use man to invent radio, television, social media, and the internet to more quickly fulfill the command found in Matthew 28, 19, where Jesus says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. As I've said before, God does not save anyone before they hear the gospel. Otherwise, how would anyone know what they are being saved from? In his letter to the Romans, the apostle Paul wrote in chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. This means a person has to hear that message first and then believe the gospel before being saved. And a person needs a preacher to hear the word of God. Otherwise, how are they going to hear? And how will they believe if they don't hear? And how can a preacher preach unless he is sent? One of the ways in today's modern times that a preacher is sent is through the use of electronic media. Romans 10, 15 says, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. And some of the feet referenced in this verse is today's technology that allows us to electronically walk the word, deliver the word, speak the word of God through radio, television, social media, and the internet in general. Understand this very important point. Apart from hearing the gospel, there is no salvation. If someone does not hear the word of God, there can be no salvation. Now, let me make this relevant for today. When you give, you have a ministry of your own because your giving allows unsaved people as well as those who are saved to hear the word of God from me and other Bible-based preachers through the use of mass media to deliver the word of God. That's how important your giving is. Your donation will help more people hear the gospel before it's too late. For if anyone dies before accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior, there is no second chance to get into heaven. An unbeliever is condemned to eternal death, which is eternal life as death in hell. To help us spread the saving grace of Jesus Christ, would you prayerfully consider going to treasuretop.com and clicking on the Give button? When you give, you not only bless others with the Word of God, but you too are blessed. God multiplies giving, and He certainly has at Treasure Top. The author Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 10, that's the last book of the Old Testament, wrote down the words of God, saying, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. This verse refers to the time when people during Old Testament times stopped giving their tithes and priests could no longer perform their priestly duties. They had to give up their full-time ministry work and begin farming because they needed income to live on. The same principle is applicable today. When you give, you are enabling preachers to use your gift to fulfill Matthew 28, 19 that we discussed a few moments ago. And when it comes to giving, if you have not heard this before, I want you to carefully listen. Nowhere in the Bible does it say anyone will receive blessings in proportion to their giving. 
that the more money one gives, the more blessings they receive. That's what's called the prosperity gospel, and the prosperity gospel is a false gospel, not the word of God. So run from any preacher who preaches the prosperity gospel. Father, we come before you today as undeserving sinners who have no right to expect your grace or your mercy and who cannot earn any entrance into heaven. We thank you, Father, that as believers we are saved by grace through faith, that it's you who draws us, not a preacher or magic phrases or being baptized. Thank you that your son Jesus Christ was crucified on the cross as payment for our sins, for as your word says, the wages of sin is death. Someone has to pay for our sins, and your son did just that for everyone who accepts him as their Lord and Savior. Father, I pray that you would use me, lead me, and guide me today in delivering your word to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. If you died tonight, why would God let you into his heaven? Well, to answer that question, there are two things we will discuss today, and these two statements don't make sense to most people. One, you cannot be good enough to get into heaven. And two, you can't be bad enough to stay out of heaven. Now, hold on, Pastor. Can you repeat that? Because it makes no sense. You said you cannot be good enough to get into heaven. You can't be bad enough to stay out of heaven. Isn't that kind of mumbo jumbo? Well, let's take a closer look at both of these statements. Let's take the first one. When I say you cannot be good enough to get into heaven, this simply means there's no way to earn a position, a promotion, a seat, uh, an entrance, or any guarantee to get into heaven. There is no amount of good works that can get you in to heaven. You know, and the truth is no one deserves anything from God. We're all born sinners with evil in our hearts and all sin must be paid for as scripture teaches us. More on that in a moment. Here's a list that I have compiled on things that won't get you into heaven. This is a checklist that you could typically find in other religions because all other religions are about do, whereas Christianity is about done. In all other religions, you must do something in order to get into what they call heaven. Here's the do list of some of the things you will see depending upon which religion it is. You must do good works, be baptized, have religion, attend church, attend Sunday school, attend mass, take communion, have the correct political affiliation, be in the right denomination, give money, provide for charity, convert friends, embrace positive thinking, read the Bible, and just overall be a good person. Nothing on that list will get you into heaven. Now, there is one thing about heaven you should know. Your reward in heaven will be based upon your good works on earth, assuming you are a Christian. But your good works on earth by themselves will not get you in to heaven. So we just went through a checklist of what won't get you into heaven. Now let's talk about the checklist that will get you into heaven. There is none. <laughs> the difference between Christianity and all other religions is... The difference between what is already done versus a checklist of what there is to do. Jesus Christ has already done for all believers. Jesus has paid for all believers' sins, past, present, and future when he was crucified on the cross. That's the done part. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. Are you saying that Christ, when he was crucified on the cross, paid not just for our past sins, but also for our present sins and for our future sins? How can that be if we haven't even committed the future sins yet? Well, here's the simple answer. Christ died for all sins of those who are believers. If he had only died for some of our sins or he had died only for certain sins but not others, well, we would have to die an eternal death for the remaining sins and live in hell for those remaining sins because the word of God says, and get this, for the wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23 is found in Paul's epistle or his letter to the Romans. The apostle Paul, by the way, was a Roman citizen born in Tarsus about the time of Christ's birth. And more than any other person, Paul was responsible for the spread of Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. And when we look at the verse for the wages of sin is death, 
The wages being referred to here is the same thing as payment, like the wages you are paid for your work. And this verse demonstrates two absolutes. The first absolute is a spiritual death for every man's sin. But understand this, that person will still be alive for eternity, but they will live that eternity in hell for unbelievers. That is what's meant by a spiritual death. Not a physical death, but a spiritual death. The second absolute is eternal life in heaven, a free gift that God gives undeserving sinners who believe in his Son, as we read in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. This verse means that it's God who saves us. You cannot save yourself. No pastor, no preacher, no magic phrases. And you cannot be saved by what is known by many as the sinner's prayer and be saved. The sinner's prayer is basically reciting a collection of phrases like, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. Yes, come into my heart. Yes, forgive me of my sins. And then trusting that because at least one time in their life, they prayed a prayer and someone told them they were saved. They were saved because they were sincere enough. And if you ask them about their salvation later, are you saved? They don't say, yes, I am because I'm following Jesus and everything I do to the best of my ability, even though I know I'm a flawed person and undeserving of his grace and mercy and I believe there is strong evidence of being born again in my life compared to what I used to be. No, what they will say is, well, one time in my life I prayed a prayer, but since then they have lived like devils, but they prayed a prayer. Now, hear me on this, folks. It is possible that you can be saved at the time you are praying the sinner's prayer, but it's not because of the sinner's prayer. It's in spite of the sinner's prayer that you are saved. In other words, it's a coincidence. Nothing can save you apart from God. In fact, we should declare war on the sinner's prayer. It sent more people to hell than anything else on earth. And you say, Pastor, how can you say such a thing? Well, I invite you to show me in Scripture where anyone was evangelized that way. The scripture does not say that Jesus Christ came to the nation of Israel and said, time is of the essence, the kingdom of God is at hand. And now who of you would like to invite me into your heart? No, Jesus said in Mark 1, 5 is recorded by the author Mark, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. John the apostle writes in John three thirty six what Jesus said. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Acts 17, 30 to 31, believed to have been written by Luke, the physician who also was a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul, wrote this, Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Of course, Luke is referring to Jesus Christ. Before we conclude today's message, if you died tonight, why would God let you in to his heaven? If you'd like to hear a replay of this message, including the ending to today's message that's coming up, just go to treasuretop.com under podcasts, and there you will see a link to this program. That's treasuretop.com. And there you will also see all of our contact information as well as other messages to help you make life work when life doesn't want to work. And sign up for our free newsletter. And because we seek to evangelize non-believers that they will be converted to Christians and for believers to energize them with the word of God to fulfill their calling, please prayerfully consider making a donation in any amount to help us continue to deliver these messages using mass media. Just go to treasuretop.com and press the give button right there at the top of the website. And thank you. And now let's conclude today's message. If you died tonight, why would God let you in to his heaven? 
A.W. Pink, known as one of the most influential evangelical authors in the 20th century after his death, once said, It was not Adam who sought God, but God who sought Adam. And this has been the order ever since. End quote. When Adam sinned, he did not run toward God. He ran from God. The first question on the lips of God in the Bible is found in Genesis 3.9. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, that's Adam speaking, I heard the sound of thee in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself, end quote. So you can see here that we do not seek God on our own. He seeks us first. And that's because we inherited the sin that Adam introduced into the world. As I said earlier, it's possible that you can be saved at the time you are praying what some call the sinner's prayer, but it's not because of the sinner's prayer that you are saved. It's in spite of the sinner's prayer that you are saved. God is the one who draws us. We do not draw ourselves to him to become saved. And I want you to hear this. There are millions of false Christians on earth today thinking they are saved because of a one-time prayer. And preachers who are supposed preachers of the word of God misrepresent, abuse, lie, or plain just don't know themselves that they are preaching a false gospel and sending people straight to hell. And here is one other truth. No one on earth knows who is saved or not saved. Only God knows the heart. Jesus was recorded in Luke 16, 15 as saying, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men, but God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. End quote. Now, we can have strong conviction based on the fruits of those whom we see in life around us, who is saved and who is not, but in the end, only God knows for sure who is and who is not saved. And it's also possible that someone who has been an unbeliever his or her entire life and is now on their deathbed, it is possible that God could save them the moment before they die. That the word of God they heard somewhere along the line in conjunction with what God does in their heart, and they become saved. When the Apostle Paul came to the church in Corinth, he did not say to them, look, you're not living like Christians, so let's go back to that one moment in your life when you prayed the sinner's prayer and see if you were sincere. No, he said this, as recorded in 2 Corinthians 13, 15, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test? End quote. Salvation is by faith alone. It's a work of God. It's grace upon grace upon grace. And here's the key. The evidence of conversion is not just examining your sincerity at the moment of your conversion. It's the ongoing fruit in your life. And by fruit, I mean what scripture includes, such as we find in Galatians 5, to 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law, end quote. Now, as a pastor, I have authority to tell you how to be saved. And I have authority to teach biblical principles of assurance. But I have no authority to tell you that you are saved. That is the work of the Holy Spirit of God. For those who go to heaven, there are going to be two major surprises when they get there. People who got into heaven that they thought never would, and people they thought for sure would get into heaven and didn't. So our original question, if you die tonight, why would God let you into his heaven? We've learned why you cannot be good enough to get into heaven and why it's not you, not your choice, but God's choice, who he draws into a relationship with him. Jesus says so, beginning in John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. Now, as I've said before, if you're not sure of two things, one, am I a Christian? Or two, I know I am a Christian, but how do I know I'm really saved? Let's briefly answer both of those questions, and then I will explain the second statement, what I meant by you can't be bad enough to stay out of heaven. 
As to the question, am I a Christian? The very fact that you are even wondering if you are a Christian can be a sign that God is drawing you. If you did not care about being converted to a Christian, that would be pretty good evidence that you are not a Christian. But the fact that you are wondering, this can be a sign that God is drawing you. And if you feel that drawing in your heart, now is the time to say, Jesus, I think you're trying to draw me to you. I I feel this stirring in my heart that I can't understand because it was never like that before. I never used to care about what I did in life, but now I just feel different. Please forgive me of my sins. I want to repent of my sins and begin a new life. I want to proclaim you as my Lord and Savior and lead my new life in a way that honors you instead of a life that's all about me like it has been. And if you are already a Christian and you are looking for assurance to, how do I know I am really saved? Well, I have a checklist for you, and it comes from the book of 1 John. Since we are about out of time, if you just go to treasuretop.com, and search using the word checklist, and there it is for you. Now let's talk about the second statement I made. You can't be bad enough to stay out of heaven. You know, a lot of people think there's no way a good God would ever let them into heaven because of something terrible they have done on earth. Maybe it's been an abortion or being a drug dealer who has killed many people, or maybe giving up a child for adoption when it was born, or maybe the guilt of divorce. The proof that no matter how bad you have been, you could still get into heaven is this. And it's illustrated by the person who wrote about half of the New Testament, who was a murderer of Christians, who went from town to town to seek them out, drag them away, and kill them. Saul, who was named after the first king of Israel, and while he was on the road to Damascus, encountered Jesus as written in Acts 9, 1 to 19, which records the external facts of his conversion. And for time's sake, I'll read you just the first few verses. Now Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, both men and women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And it came about that as he journeyed, he was approaching Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, but rise and enter the city, and it shall be told you what you must do. End quote. Saul, whose Roman name is Paul, was converted from a pagan murderer of Christians to a follower of Jesus Christ. And it was Jesus who sought Saul, not the other way around. See how it works? And if Jesus Christ can draw a murderer of Christians and convert him into a Christian, couldn't he do the same thing in your life? No matter what you've ever done in your life. For the time we have left, here are a few signs of someone who is not a Christian. Lack of faith in Jesus Christ. John 3.18 says, He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Another sign of someone who is not a Christian, living in unrepentant sin. 1 Corinthians 6.9-10 Or do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. End quote. Revelation 21.8 But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death, end quote. The lake is the lake of fire and refers to the final living place for eternity for all those who are condemned to hell. Hell and what it will be like is spoken about in a number of scriptures in the Bible. In fact, Jesus talked more about hell than he did anything else. And he did that because he wants us to know that hell is real. You might want to write down these scripture references as I'm not going to have time to cite the full verse for each reference about hell, but here's what we know. Hell is described as a furnace of fire, eternal fire, eternal punishment. You'll find that in Matthew 13, 42 and 13, 50, Matthew 25, 41 and 25, 46. Outer darkness, the place of weeping and torment 
And you'll find that in Matthew 8, 12. The wrath of God in Romans 2, 5. Everlasting separation from the Lord, never to see the glory of his power. You'll see that in 2 Thessalonians 1, 9. The bottomless pit in Revelation 9, 1 and 9, 11. Continuous torment, Revelation 14, 10 and 11. The lake of fire, the second death, Revelation 21, 8. And a place for the devil and his demons, Matthew 25, 41. Another sign of someone who is not a Christian, loving the world more than God. 1 John 2, 15 to 17 warns against loving the world or the things in the world, stating that if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And that refers to prioritizing worldly desires over God's will. Do Christians struggle with sin? Yes. Can a Christian fall into sin? Absolutely. Can a Christian live in a continuous state of carnality all the days of their life, not bearing fruit and truly be a Christian? Absolutely not. Or the word of God is a lie. You know, a tree is known by its fruit. God seeks us. Like I've said, we do not seek him. We can't save ourselves. Only God can save us. So now we have the answer to the question, if you die tonight, why would God let you in to his heaven? The only sin that can keep anyone out of heaven is to deny Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you accept the prompting of God in your heart, confess your sins, ask for forgiveness, and accept Jesus into your heart and proclaim his name, Scripture teaches you will go to heaven. Well, that's all the time we have today, and remember that you can download this message right now free of charge or any of my radio messages by going to treasuretop.com and selecting the podcast tab. You can also subscribe for free so that you never miss another message. And please consider making a generous tax-deductible gift to Treasure Top to help us continue to broadcast the Word of God on radio, TV, YouTube, social media, and the Internet. And you can help us do just that with your donation of any amount. And we have three ways to give your tax-deductible donation on the website at treasuretop.com and click on the Give button at the top of the screen. You can also text your donation with the word GIVE to 844-553-1590. That's the word GIVE to 844-553-1590. And if you prefer by mail, our address is Post Office Box 210-615, Nashville, Tennessee, 37221. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this study in your word today on if someone died tonight, why would you let that person in to your heaven? Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who became sin for us when he was nailed to the cross to pay our sin bill in full so that all believers are able to join you one day soon in eternity. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. And now it's Pastor John Haggard saying, until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, amen.